So, the title of my sermon tonight is The Spirit of Fear. And this sermon is a little bit more impromptu than some other sermons I've preached before. So I decided to change what I wanted to preach on tonight um, just based on some things that I heard yesterday and just kind of what's been going on recently. And anytime there's attacks, anytime there's, you know, persecution happening, um, the, I think that this is, this is a topic that needs to be dealt with. The spirit of fear is, is there's so many directions you can take with this. The, you know, this is a, a topic that is covered all throughout Scripture, beginning to end, and, and many ways that you can go with this. Uh, but I want to kind of head this off with, with the, the understanding that the Bible teaches that you know, we're, to, we're soldiers for Christ, that we are in a spiritual battle, we're in a spiritual war. We can't ever forget that or mistake that. There's, you know, the lukewarm Christians out there want to just be, oh, no, no, love, 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 and everything's just great and happy and roses. And if you don't have everybody loving you all the time, you're doing something wrong, you're not very Christ-like, and they'll just throw this at you and try to make you think that this is the attitude that we're supposed to have. And you're supposed to just be gentle and real softy, and never say anything that might upset anybody or offend anybody and basically just tolerate and allow for all manner of filth and wickedness and everything else and okay you could intellectually disagree with somebody but that's where it should end and you know and and that's garbage sorry I, it's garbage right and that is not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus Christ did. That's not what the apostles did. That's not the way they lived their life. Why in the world do you think they were being arrested? Right. They're being persecuted. They're being beaten. Right. Oh, they were just being real softies, right? That just got along with everybody and they didn't want to ruffle any feathers, huh? Then why did the Bible say, hey, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. They hear the everything that's going on in other places. Man, these guys are here now and they're stirring up trouble and they're causing problems. How are they stirring up problems? What are they doing? Through their preaching, through what they're saying. They're not going out and literally like, getting in fist fights or anything. And of course, that's not what we should be doing either. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what our fight is against. And many times in Scripture, you're going to see we are soldiers. We're supposed to endure as a soldier for Christ. And, uh, you know, obviously there's many areas where the Bible kind of gives us different um, analogies and, and, and different symbolic references of, of how you can view your Christian life. And one of them is as a soldier. Now, you have to deal with fear when you're dealing with fights, when you're dealing with battles because a fight is uncomfortable for the vast majority of people i'm one of them okay i am not the type of person that just loves conflict and fight i've known a few people like that that's not how how i operate and i think most people don't i mean you'd rather just get along and i would you know i i'd love for there to be peace I want peace, but the only way we're going to have peace is if everything's going according to God's will, is if God's rules, God's laws, God's judgment, if that's being done, then amen, there's going to be great peace. Unfortunately, there are adversaries out there that want to stop the work of God, stop the word of God from being preached, and you know what that means? There's going to be a fight because I'm not willing to let the opposition push me back. I'm going to stand up and face the opposition because that's what's right, because that's what we're called to do. But what happens is, unfortunately, people, because they don't like the fight or because of some other reason, they might start to get fearful of what might happen. And the biggest thing that people are afraid of is the unknown. 
And people, you just, you just don't know what's going to happen. I was just counseling someone the other day that asked me a question, said that he wanted to know, and, and this, is, this is somewhat related, but, but a little bit different, asking, hey, how can I overcome this fear that I have? And his fear had to do with going out soul winning and knocking on doors where they had maybe like a no soliciting sign or no trespassing sign or something like that because say when I, when I knock on, you know, when I see the sign, you know, all of a sudden you start to think, oh man, you know, they're going to call the cops, am I going to get arrested? And you kind of start going through these scenarios that make you afraid, right? And what fear does is that it could cripple people into not doing what's right or what you're supposed to do just because you start to get a fearful attitude. Um, we see people making very bad decisions when fear comes into the picture. When you start allowing fear to influence you, you're going to make some really bad decisions. One of the first mentions of, of someone being afraid or fearful is Adam in the Garden of Eden. You know, when after he eats of the fruit, then God comes to, to talk to him and he hides himself. He says, why are you hiding yourself? Because I was afraid. I heard you and I, and I was afraid. You know, I covered myself. I was afraid. So what's he doing? He's getting away from God because he's afraid. Not the right thing to do. I mean, I mean yes, we need to have a fear of the Lord. But he was, I mean, he was afraid for, from, his, you know, from his own actions. And you ought to be able to just... You know, I mean, I know God's almighty. Yeah, we, we have to have a proper fear of the Lord. No doubt about that. But own up to what he did, you know. Just <laughs> here I am, Lord. Sorry. Right. Instead of trying to cover up what was done. I, this is what I did, God. Sorry. Right. And that's the right attitude to have. But another example from the book of Genesis of someone fearing. And this might might ring true a little bit more for what I'm trying to explain here is when Abraham and Sarah were going into different areas, different cities, and he had already told her, hey, when we go into this place, because this is, a, this is not a God-fearing place. These people, you know, they're wicked people that live here, and because I'm married to you and you're beautiful, you know, they might want to take you to be their wife, and since I'm your husband, they'll kill me. So here's what we do. We're just going to tell them that we're brother and sister and don't tell them that we're married. And that was his plan. And that plan was completely based off of fear. And that's not right. He shouldn't have done that. That almost got him in trouble. Like, that almost caused there to be like an adulterous relationship because the men of that city didn't even know that she was married and, you know, could, it, was, it was about to result in, in her becoming another man's wife even though she's already married. And, um, you know, God steps in and intervenes to help Abraham out. But that decision based off of fear was completely the wrong decision and, and really could have screwed up a lot of things in his life just because he made a decision based off of fear. And when you think about it, fear, what is fear of the unknown? It's also a lack of faith because faith is your belief in the things that you can't see. And oftentimes a fear comes from the things you can't see, right? So Abraham was promised by God that, hey, God's going to protect him. God's going to give him a son. God, you know, all this stuff. No one's going to touch uh, his anointed. And, and Abraham knew these things going into these places, yet that lack of faith is what prompted the fear. And the fear apparently looked unfounded. Because the, the guys of the city, like, like he thought they're extremely wicked and, you know, they may have been wicked, but we don't, I don't get anything from the story saying that they would have killed him if they would have known. Because he's just kind of like, well, why didn't you just tell me? Right? And then we see his son, Isaac, doing the same exact thing. And except that time he sees him sporting with his wife and he's like, well, <laughs> why didn't you tell me? I mean, someone could have just wanted to marry your wife. You should have just said something. But it's that fear. It's, it, you start conjuring up these things that might happen. And, you know, the guy I was talking to, you start conjuring up all these things. And when it comes to things like soul winning, well, you know, we just got to trust that when you're doing something that God wants you to do, something that God commands you to do, 
God's already promised he'll protect you. He'll look out for you. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his promise. We know that God will take care of us. If you're doing his will and God allows something bad to happen, well, hey, it's God's will anyway. So if, if he's going to allow that to happen, then fine. But when you're walking in the spirit, when you're serving God, when you're doing what he tells you to do, you just do it and don't worry about what's going to happen afterwards. You just do what's right. Because God will take care of you. God has promised to do that. And it, and it stems from this lack of faith. We started off reading in Psalm 118. The reason why we started here is because the Bible tells us some very clear verses just that we don't have to fear anything because God is on our side. If the Lord be for us, if God be for us, who could be against us? And that's the attitude we need to maintain and have with us especially in the midst of a battle, in the midst of a fight, because, yeah, the enemy is going to try to do things to make you be afraid. And oftentimes you don't know, well, what are they going to do? Well, I don't know. And so many Christians today are just so worried about, well, I don't know if the Sodomites come after me. I mean, I might be on the news or I might be here. Or this might happen to me or that might happen to me. You don't even know what's going to happen, yet you're so afraid that you just refuse to do what's right. You refuse to stand up with the man of God. You refuse to stand up for God's word and you're just crippled in fear. Well, look what the Bible says in Psalm 118, verse number six. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Hey, if you, if you are standing on this foundation, if you have the word of God, if you're preaching the word of God, you know who's going to be on your side? The Lord. Because these are his words. If you're out there just preaching the word of the Lord, guess who's on your side? The Lord's on my side. And if the Lord's on my side, I will not fear. How, how could you have, and think about this, think about this from God's perspective. When you start to fear some other creation of God's, instead of fearing the creator of what he can actually do as opposed to just, oh, I'm worried about what that person's going to do. Well, they're wicked. Yeah, but God's almighty. <laughs> so, no matter how wicked that person is, God's almighty, and if he says to do something, we do it. And we don't even need to fear. Verse number seven, the Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Well, I wonder what his desire is. Think about that. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Do you think that he's like wishing them the best? When he's talking about his desire upon them that hate him? No. He's talking about being in a battle. He's talking about the Lord being on his side and these people that are fighting against God and have become his enemies that hate him because he's making a stand for the Lord. He said, you know what? God's going to make sure that my desire comes on them. He's not getting involved in a physical battle. But he's saying, you know what? God's going to take care of it. Verse number eight is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Look at verse 10. If you ever had a reason to be afraid of something, how about verse 10? All nations compassed me about. The whole world has surrounded me. They're all against me. Yea, they compassed me about. Or verse number 10. But in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. The whole world could come against me, but I'm going to destroy them. In the name of the Lord will I destroy them. Verse 11, they have compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. That's his desire upon them that hate him. Destruction. Oh, that's so Christian of you. Yeah, 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 it is. That is a Christian attitude to have on the people that hate God. 
Flip over to Psalm 56. Psalm 56, we're going to start reading verse number 1. We're going to read this whole psalm. The Bible says, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Wow. So here's David talking about a daily fight, a daily battle. Yeah, that wears on you. And you know, a battle, sometimes it can make people afraid. But when you're standing up for what's right, you got to expect this. The Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's a daily battle, a daily oppression going on here. Verse number two, Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. For they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Well, when you're dealing with daily enemies, daily battle, they, they all want to kill me every day. Yeah, trusting in the Lord is a good, is the right thing to do. Of course, we should turn to God. In verse number four, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And that's a good way of, of explaining what, you know, what man can do unto me. It's just flesh. It's just God. God just created flesh. God just created some man. I'm not going to worry what that can do unto me, what that flesh can do unto me because I'm going to trust in God. God is capable. God is almighty. God will take care of me. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. Every day they rest my words. Rest means like, like wrestling. They're twisting his words. They're trying to use his words against him. Sound familiar? Sound like anybody you know? Have anyone trying to take their words out of context and use them against them? All their thoughts are against me for evil. This is representative of the spiritual battle that we face as a Christian. Verse number six, they gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. These are people who are intent on destruction and killing and hurting. And they're, they're like lying in wait. They're trying to set traps. They're watching where I go. They're watching my movements. They're tracking me down. They're trying to shut down my PayPal and shut down and deplatform me and get everything you know, so I can't do or say anything. They wait for my soul. Verse 7, shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger, cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall my, mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is, with, God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. This is the steadfastness we need to have. Hey, everybody's against me. Every day they're trying to come after me. Every day they're trying to battle me and shut me down and get me to stop. But I know that God is for me. And I know that God is with me. In God, I'm going to praise his words. I will praise his words every day. Verse 11, in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? We have no reason to fear. That's evident. And we could go on and 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 on through the whole book of Psalms, showing the Lord is my strength, the Lord is my refuge, the Lord is my buckler, the Lord is my shield. We don't need to fear. I just picked two Psalms out that, that basically are teaching the same thing all throughout Scripture. God is our rock. God is our shepherd. We, we trust in Him. Flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I think one of the reasons why that's repeated so much in Scripture is because man in general has a hard time with having the faith to just trust in God. And man is fearful. Man does have a lot of problems with being afraid of the unknown, being afraid of what's out there and not really having uh, full faith in God. Psalm 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The fear that people have of anything that might happen to you. Well, if I say that, I might be killed. If I go in that, and if I go in that area to preach the gospel, they might kill me. If I do this to serve God, oh, I might, get, I might, I might lose my job. I might, you know, fill in the blank. You're afraid of those things. You're afraid of doing things that God's commanded you to do. God's not giving you that spirit of fear. That is not a spirit from God. You are not filled with the spirit of God. God gives us boldness. God gives us strength. You're walking in the spirit, you're going to have boldness. God's given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Verse number eight. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And this brings me into really the main focus of why I want to preach this sermon about fear and everything else is because I'm sick of the people that are true believers. Not just the people who call themselves Christians, but the people who actually believe God's word, being afraid and not willing to stand by people who are making a stand. The Apostle Paul here, he's in prison for preaching the gospel. He's in prison for preaching the word of God, for standing on the truth, even though it offends people. Even though it turns people, rubs people the wrong way, and they get upset, and they want to stop him, and they want to silence him, he does it anyways, to the point to where he gets put in prison, and he's saying, look, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Why? Because for the testimony of our Lord, people are getting thrown in prison. Or, he says, nor of me as prisoner. So don't be afraid of Jesus. And you know what? Don't be afraid of me either. Because I'm making the stand for Jesus. Don't be, don't be ashamed that, oh yeah, my friend that got thrown into prison, oh yeah, he's just some, he's some crazy kook. You know, he's way out there. He's super extreme. Well, because think about it. There, was everybody being thrown into prison? I don't think so. Not at this time. He was, he was extreme. So that's why he's thrown into prison. Oh, yeah, Paul, yeah, I don't... I like some of the things he says, but he's kind of way out there for me. I mean, I don't know why he had to go and get himself arrested. Yeah, how are you serving God now, Paul, from a prison cell? That's not working out for you. This is the stupid mentality and the mindset of modern day believers that, that, that want to distance themselves and back off from people who are in a spiritual battle on the front lines trying to fight wicked people and wickedness in this world when they're just cowering and backing down and they don't have the fear of the Lord. They have the fear of man and they're afraid of what man can do unto them and refuse to take a stand and in so doing, they are doing more hurt and damage for the cause of Christ than anything else because they're weak and spineless and a bunch of stinking cowards Amen. be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me as prisoner but be thou partaker so instead of being ashamed hey why don't you join us why don't you stand up with us be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God but no too many people today they don't want the affliction they want to live the comfortable life. They don't know, well, what would I ever do if I lost my job? Well, you know what? God will figure that out for you. Amen. He'll take care of you. Just do what he says. Amen. You think he doesn't know that you have need of all these things? People have already come up with this problem to God. They've already thought of it. And he's already answered it. Says, you, you think God doesn't know that you have need of being clothed and being fed. You think God is that dumb that he's created you and he doesn't realize that you need to support your family and you need to support yourself. Of course he knows this. 
So if he tells you to do something, if he tells you no, believe, proclaim, shout it from the rooftops. Make sure everybody hears it. Yeah. Preach the gospel to every creature. Stand on the word of God. Stand for the truth. If something bad's going to happen, you think he's not going to take care of you then? That all of a sudden he's going to back away and distance himself? Oh, that guy's extreme. From the one that's standing up for his word? No, that's exactly the people he's going to be lifting up and helping out. Did the Apostle Paul go to prison? Yes, he did. Was he taken care of? Sure. Was it comfortable? Nope. Not at all. He wasn't living in some penthouse. He had people driving him around. No. It was, it was difficult. But God was with him. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have God with me God on my side, God before me in a prison cell, then God just completely departed from me in some mansion somewhere, living some comfortable life, living some, some waste of a life where you're not doing anything of real value anyways. Jump down to verse number 11. The Bible says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. So he's saying, I was appointed to be a preacher. I was appointed to be an apostle. I was appointed to be a teacher of the Gentiles. And for this reason, because I was doing these things, because I'm preaching, because I'm a teacher, because I'm an apostle, for the which cause I also suffer these things. That's why I'm suffering, because I'm doing these things, because I'm serving God in this capacity, in the way that he wanted me to do this. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Hey, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of standing up on the Word of God. So when the media comes and says, well, are you going to take that back now? Oh, don't you know? You lost your job. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of what God's Word says. I'm not ashamed of any of it. Amen. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. He's able to do that. God is all-powerful. Flip over to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. And we're going to read verse number 7. The Bible says, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. God's people ought to have his laws in their heart. You know, this is Old Testament, Pastor Burson. God's people ought to have his law in their heart. Amen. Because you know what the New Testament says? Well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Romans chapter 6. Well, if we shouldn't continue in sin, how are we not going to sin? Well, maybe we should know the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. <laughs> so in order to keep a New Testament teaching, shall we continue in sin? God forbid! Of course not! Well, in order not to do that, we need to know what a sin is. Let's go back to the law. Obviously, we're not saved by the law. The, the keeping of the law doesn't save our soul. That's a free gift. It always has been. It's always been by grace through faith. Always, always, always. But for the believers, Romans chapter 6, the law is still there. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. You didn't come to get rid of the law. The law was never able to save. The law was given as a schoolmaster to point us unto Christ, to point us to show us that we are sinners and we need a Savior. Let's keep reading here in um, verse number seven. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. So this is who he's talking to, people who love God's law. Fear ye not 
the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Why is he saying this? Because God knows that when you have a person who believes on the Lord and who actually has his law in their heart, people who are actually going to live godly, people who actually want to do what's right, that there is going to be reproach, that there are going to be people reviling you and he's warning you saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the nasty things that they say or their threatenings or their cursings or whatever they want to do to, to get you to stop doing what you do. Don't be afraid of it. It doesn't matter what they say, what they threaten or what they do. Don't be afraid of it. Verse 8, for the moth shall eat them up like a garment and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. He's saying they're going to die and get eaten up and go away. You don't have to worry about them. They're here today, gone tomorrow. But my righteousness, that's eternal. That's forever. So rest in that. Verse number 11, jump down to verse number 11. The Bible says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy maker that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and hath feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? He's saying, look, I have everlasting joy. I have, I have, I have all this laid out for you already. It's going to be good. He says, I'm going to be the one that comforts you. I'm the one that's here for you. I'm going to strengthen you. You're going to be worried about this guy? You're going to be worried about this man? Who's afraid of a man that's just going to die? God's like, I'm forever. This fool's going to die. You're worried about this oppressor? And you know what? There may be fury from an oppressor in this world. We can expect that, but don't be afraid of that. Because when you fear, you make all the wrong choices. When you allow fear to enter into your mind, you're going to make the wrong choice. Don't be afraid. Fear not what man can do to you. That's why I love the story in Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because those are perfect examples of facing the fury of the oppressor. King Nebuchadnezzar, who made the, the, the statute of saying, well, when you hear the sound of the music playing, the cornet, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all manner of music, and I know I'm lit and probably missed out a few other instruments, in my quotation of that passage, but when you hear all the music, you know, you need to bow down and you need to worship the image. And if you don't bow down and worship the image, when you hear the sound of the horn, sackbut, psaltery, <laughs> then you'll be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, right? So there's, here is very real, and now this is not unknown fear, this is known. This is, hey, you don't do this, you're getting cast into that furnace. It's not even a, well, I don't know what's going to happen if we don't do this, right? right? This is, well, that's what's going to happen. You say, well, that's legitimate, Pastor Burzens. What do you expect them to do? I mean, how are they going to be able to reach more people if they're dead? And this is the way that, that Christians want to justify their disobedience to God's word. They'll use this reasoning or logic to explain away why they don't do what they're supposed to do. 
Watch out for that. It's the same reasoning that says, oh, well, you know, you think that homosexuals should be put to death? Well, I mean, what about them getting saved? I mean, if you put people to death, then there's just no more chance. What if they get saved later on? And this is people where, because they don't like that one stance, and it's like, well, what about the serial killer that you think should be put to death? Shouldn't he be allowed? Shouldn't he get saved? Then you're saying, well, maybe we shouldn't kill anybody because what if they get saved? And then what you're doing is you're judging God's law because God's the one that said they should be put to death. Well, are you more holy and righteous than God? Are you going to judge God? Say, well, God, why didn't you let these people live a little bit longer because they might have gotten saved? Right. That's right. It's the stupidity of trying to reason out things Oh, well, it's a greater good. Just let them live longer because we could reach them. No, look, if God said it, then that's what's right. Don't go trying to change and be more holy or more loving than God. So in that story in Daniel, you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They know the outcome. Hey, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. But they had the right godly attitude because they said, you know, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. Say, we heard you. We heard the commandment. And you know what? We're not going to have to sit down and think and get the most politically correct answer and make sure we don't offend you and try to say it as, as politely as possible. Look, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Amen. We're not bowing down to that image. We know that our God is able to save us. And he said, even if he doesn't, though, if he decides not to, we're not bowing down. Oh, they're so rebellious. Don't you know you're supposed to submit to everything that the government says? No. Another fallacy of, of modern day Christianity. We ought to have the same attitude that just says, hey, I'm not careful. I'm not going to fear. Even when confronted with being tossed into a furnace, which, man, do I not want that to happen, right? I mean, you think about different ways to die. I don't want to be thrown into an oven, even if it kills me before I get down to the bottom. That doesn't sound very pleasant. That sounds like it would hurt a little bit. But the level of faith and confidence that we should be putting in God and saying, you know what? We're going to stand for his word no matter what the consequence is because that's what's right. God never said, well, obey my commandments unless some other man threatens you or your life. Then don't obey my commandments and obey that man. No. Preach the gospel to every creature. But if man makes a law that says you can't go and knock on that person's door and you can't go and talk to that person and you can't go and evangelize, then just don't do it. Uh, no, I think God is God and man's not God. I think we ought to obey God rather than man. And it's only the lame, weak, coward Christians that want to have the excuse and say, oh, well, they said we can't do it here, so I guess I won't do it. And then there's the same ones that are going to go and attack the group that is going out doing it, and they're getting on the news, oh, man, they're breaking the law over here, and there's all these cops out, and they're arresting people because, you know, these troublemakers, they're out harassing people, and, make, you know, and they're going to slander and say all manner of evil against them falsely. Right? Because that's what's going to happen when you're doing the, the work of the Lord. They're going to lie about you. They're going to try to cast down your name as evil. It's no surprise. But that's what happens when people are actually standing up for God. Look at what they did to Jesus. He wasn't received. He was rejected. He was lied about. He was killed. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 
We start reading in verse number 24. Bible reads, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. That goes hand in hand with what I was talking about before. Are you better than God? Are you going to judge God's laws? You are not better. You're not above your master. It says in verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? They called Jesus the devil. They called Jesus the devil. They said that the power that Jesus had of the Holy Ghost when he was healing people was of Satan, was of the devil. Which, by the way, is the unpardonable sin that Jesus said, well, you never have forgiveness because you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. So when these wicked people are making that claim against him, he says, how much more are they going to say the same of his, of his household? These wicked reprobates, when they're slandering and calling out people's names because they're standing against the wickedness and the vile and the filthiness. I think it's telling when they've got nothing bad to say about these other believers because they're not saying anything about them. They have no cross words to say about them. To me, it shows, well, then they're not really following Jesus because the Bible says here, hey, if they've called the master Beelzebub, how much more should they call them of his household? So the wicked people out there, if they're not casting out your name and just saying all manner of this evil against you, you're not really following Jesus because that's what they did to Jesus. Amen. And real believers, people who are saved, are backing off and distancing themselves from the people who are following Jesus and they're distancing them themselves because they're being called all these names and in the world's eyes, they look crazy and they look nuts and we can't have that. Shame on you who doesn't stand with that person in their affliction and decides to back off and actually, in some cases, people take part in their affliction. Shame on the believer who might be in a position to fire somebody or not fire them. And okay, they're told from someone else, you need to fire this person because of what they believe, because they're standing on the word of God. And that's what they're told. And that person believes the same thing and they fire them, shame on that person. That is so wicked. That is such a wicked thing to do. And that is the reason why things are so bad right now. I know multiple cases of this happening. What I'm just talking about, this isn't just made up. This has happened, and it's happened recently because there's too many cowards out there that claim they believe the Bible, they claim they believe what's right, but they won't take a stinking stand. Why? Because they love money more than they love God. Because they fear what man can do unto them, and they don't fear God, and they refuse to stand with the man of God. And I'm sick of it. Where are these believers? Where are these people standing up for what's right? You're going to leave the few people hang out to dry and just say, see ya. Where is the love of God of you? Where is the love of your brethren? If you're willing to take their income and, and just and shut them down and make things harder for them to serve the Lord because of money, because you're afraid of what some man's going to do, or you're afraid someone's going to fire you, so you're afraid someone's going to take your business away, you're afraid of that, shame on you. We expect that from the world. We're going to get that from the unsaved world. We're going to get that from the heathen. We're going to get that from the God-haters. But shame on you, Christian, 
that's going to take their side, the side of the wicked, the side of the Pharisees that were saying what Jesus did is of the devil. You're going to take their side yep. over Jesus' side. That's right. Because when someone is standing on this word and all the words of this book, they're standing with Jesus. Amen. And when you are going against the man that's standing for Jesus, you're standing against Jesus. Let's keep reading here in Matthew 10, because this whole, this whole passage deals with this very thing. Verse number 26. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Jesus doesn't want his word being concealed. He's saying, yes, they're going to say all manner of evil against you. They're going to call you the devil. They're going to say how wicked and how horrible you are. Because that's what they did to him. He says, but don't be afraid of them. Instead, shout it from the housetops. You know what happens when you shout the word of God from the housetops? It gets attention. People might start looking at you. People might start saying bad things about you. You know what the last thing that that person needs then, the person who's actually willing to obey the Bible and obey Jesus and say, you know what, I will shout from the housetops, is to have his brethren, people of his own spiritual family, brothers and sisters in Christ, going, whoa, hey, you're making a little bit too much noise there. I don't want to be associated with you because now people are starting to ask me questions. Right. Now people are coming to me. Yeah, so the right answer is just leave that guy out there. Leave him alone. Wicked. Wicked. You ought to be supporting, supporting as much as you can. Strengthen, comfort, stand with them. You know, if that person's already put themselves out there, it'll be easier for you to stand with them because there's already one. Yes. He's doing it on his own. Why don't you go join him, help him out, and you know what, it'll already be easier with you. You won't even know what he had to go through because he was out there by himself first. Just go join him. It's easier for you. Verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Yeah, they might kill you. But don't fear him. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who's that? God. Fear God. Verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Talk about great comfort. God knows that they're going to threaten you to be put you to death and that they might put you to death. But he says, you know what? I've got all the hairs on your head numbered. You're God's child. God loves you. He's telling you to do something and then now confirming, hey, you know what? I've got all the hairs of your head numbered. I know you inside and out. I know you well. I'll be with you. But do what I'm telling you to do, son. Verse 31, Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him, also, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Strong words. This doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but I'd rather have Jesus go into bat for me when I'm on this earth than Jesus going, oh yeah, I remember when he was denying his brother in Christ, when he was denying being affiliated with my word, when he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Now he's in trouble. You know what? Father, no, let him go through it. 
That's what that verse is talking about. Verse 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Oh, Jesus was a pacifist. He wanted everyone to get... He didn't come to send peace on this earth. A sword. What does a sword do? It divides. It separates. Right, wrong, good, evil. Word of God separates. Verse 35, for I am come. Jesus Christ saying this. This is coming out of his mouth. For I am come to set it man at variance against his father. Well, that doesn't sound very Christian of you, Jesus. Well, I'm glad so many people know what's Christian yeah. other than Jesus. And the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We read the story about Eli this morning. Eli was someone who loved his sons more than he loved God. And what happened to Eli? Cursed. Died, fell down, broke his neck. His posterity, nothing good. Cursed. Verse 38, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Saying, oh, you want to stay out of the fight? You want to stay out of the battle? You want to keep play the safe path and not have anything to do with these people? God will just make sure you lose your life anyways. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. This is about our attitudes. What are you willing to do? Are you going to stay in it to death? Or are you just going to back out when things get a little hot? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were cast in the fire, you know what? They walked with Jesus. They stood up and did what's right, and we're still talking about them today. And they have that cool experience, and that's going to be with them for eternity. How cool is that? Yeah, we were thrown in the fire. Not, not a hair of our head was hurt. Why? Because God's got them all numbered. And he likes to make his power made known. And when people just obey... Because he's capable of watching over and protecting us. And we're not going to fear what man can do. Verse 40 says, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Don't reject the prophet. Don't reject the man of God. Don't reject these people who are standing up. Receive them. You receive them. The Bible saying you'll get a reward for that. Why? Because it's going to help them and encourage them and you're going to, you'll be a blessing to them. And God will even reward you for that. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of, of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall no wise lose his reward. Mark chapter 8, last place we're going to look at tonight. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's way too many Christians out there. And when I say Christian, I'm not using that term loosely. I mean believers. I mean real Christians that have the Peter attitude and mindset. Like when Peter denied the Lord three times. Jesus was taken in the garden. And then when Jesus followed afar off. Yeah, you could say he was following Jesus, but he followed way far off. He was way back there. Sure, he was a believer. But when things got, got heavy there and then he was being confronted, oh, wait, are, aren't you one of them? Nope. Nope. Don't know him. Yeah, you, wait, no, you do. Yes, you were. I saw you. Were, nope. Wasn't me. 
start to curse and to swear. When the spotlight shined directly on you. He was bold when all of his friends were around. And he took out his sword and he was with, you know, he's standing there side by side. And you know what? Praise God for that. But when it was all him alone by himself, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. We need more people, first of all, that when they are alone, will still stand up right and say yes. I mean, John was in there already. The Apostle John was in there. He wasn't the one denying Jesus. They knew he was with them. And what happened to John? Nothing there. Yet Peter still was afraid. And what happened? Peter thought on that and he wept bitterly. That hurts. I don't want Christians to have that same experience. Don't be like Peter. I mean, Peter, I'm sure, wishes that he never had done those things. Because he's ashamed of it. You get to crossroads in your life. You have decisions to make. Someone says, hey, aren't you with that guy? You have a choice. Yes or no. It happens real fast. Am I going to be afraid and say no? Or am I going to be bold and say yes? And no matter what the consequences are, whatever the outcome is, just think about, well, what's right? Should I deny Jesus or not? It doesn't matter what the consequences. What are the consequences? It doesn't matter what the consequences are. What's right? You think it's right to take away a man's livelihood because he was on the news? Because people are are hating on him? And you're a Christian and you claim to believe the same thing? The people that do that, they're going to lose what they think they're saving. God will deal with them. And I don't even have to pray for anything like that. God will just deal with them. God will take care of them because if they're a child of God too, God will, you know, you, you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. It's going to happen. Don't be like that. Because you, 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 you can't. You can't save it. Mark chapter 8. Look at verse 34, right at the end of the chapter there. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. He says, this generation is wicked, it's vile, it's sinful, and that's the only reason why you're going to be ashamed of Jesus Christ is because of what all the wicked people around you are saying. And he's saying, you know what? You're going to be ashamed of me now. You're going to be ashamed of me in that environment where you're surrounded by wicked people. But you know what? I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come in my glory, when I come with my kingdom and finally show you this is what's happening. They're being destroyed. This kingdom's being set up and this is an eternal kingdom. And I'm ashamed of you because you couldn't stand in that vile, wicked environment and just not be ashamed of this. And they will be ashamed when, when the kingdom of God comes, and he's talking about, you know, believers, they're going to be ashamed. People who are too weak because they're so worried about the stinking, filthy, wicked society that they're in and what they think about Jesus Christ instead of worrying about what God thinks about them. Right. Wake up! Get right with God! Stand with the people who are standing against the enemies of the Lord. Stand with the people that are standing for God's word. You know how you identify them? When the world doesn't love them. When the world doesn't receive them. Because the world is of the world. The world is of the devil. 
The things of God are not the things of the world. It's that simple. Well, hopefully, everyone here will be able to make it and support one of our <coughs> pretty local pastors with, with uh, Pastor Fritz on Saturday. Someone who's decided to just publicly defend the Word of God and publicly preach the Word of God. And he's being hated for it. And there's others like him that are doing the same exact thing. Let's support these people. Support them in their work. Stand with them. Don't be ashamed of what they're doing. When you go to work or when you go somewhere else, don't be ashamed of, of being associated you know, with that hate preacher from Norcross. Don't be ashamed. Oh, was that your pastor on the news? Whoa. He said what? He said those things? Don't be ashamed. If you believe that, if you believe what the Bible says, if you believe that to be true, don't be ashamed. Hey, if I go off and just do something wicked and, and I get, you know, busted or whatever, yeah, be ashamed, be ashamed that, that I would do something like that. But if I'm being persecuted or whatever because of, of what the Bible says, don't be ashamed of that. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, for your gift of eternal life. God, we thank you for giving us so many opportunities to serve you. I pray that you will please help us to stir up the, the, the souls and the spirits of, those, of other believers here. God, help us not only to just reach the lost, but to, to get people fired up to serve you and to stand with you, dear Lord. And um, God, I just pray that you would use us in the way that you would see fit and, um, and help us to, to stay strong. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.